The catch. The drive. The Music City miracle. The helmet catch. The immaculate reception. All plays that brought teams and fan bases tremendous joy. But what about the pain? What about the pain and suffering caused by singular, singular terrible plays? That is what today's episode is all about. This is part one of a two-part video series where I will bring you the one play I think every NFL franchise wishes they could have back, a redo to change their football legacy, a do-over to give themselves a chance to win a Super Bowl, a mulligan to destroy the Patriots dynasty. You get it. Part one. Whew. That's good, sports. Trying something new today. We'll see if you like it. Subscribe here. Today's episode, though, is sponsored by Manscaped. Manscaped.com slash good sports and the brand new Weed Whacker nose hair trimmer. Manscaped has reinvented the nose and ear hair trimmer, utilizing their proprietary skin safe technology to reduce nicks, snags, and tugs with their 360 degree rotary dual blade system to whack off your nose hairs. This is a great Father's Day gift because it's a lot easier to tell your dad his nose hairs are getting a little bit long as opposed to telling him his pubes need some manscaping. The Weed Whacker is designed to fit the natural ergonomics of your nose holes. Ergonomics and nose holes. Put those words together and you'll definitely impress some people. Check out the new performance package, which gets you the Weed Whacker, the Lawnmower 3.0, plus a free pair of boxer briefs, a Manscaped travel bag, the pube mat, the ball toner, and ball deodorant. And if you select the Peak Hygiene Plan, you can get a replacement blade every three months for just $14.99. Now for both the Lawnmower 3.0 and the Weed Whacker. Again, manscaped.com slash good sports is your discount link. Let's begin with the Giants, the Giants of New York City. If they could get one play back, it is the miracle at the Meadowlands, kicking the ball to Deshaun Jackson. Well, to be clear, the miracle at the new Meadowlands. I mean, I'm sure they want both back, but you can't be too mad at Herm Edwards for just playing to win the game. The Eagles and the Giants were tied 31-31. All the Giants had to do was kick the ball out of bounds, and the game would have gone into overtime. Instead, the Eagles, who were down 31 to 10 with 8.17 to go, capped off a miraculous comeback with a walk-off 65-yard Deshaun Jackson punt return touchdown that sent the Eagles to the playoffs and sent the Giants home in 2010. Matt Dodge got yelled at by Tom Coughlin until he was bright red in the face, and honestly, that's fair, considering this was as avoidable as Plaxico Burris shooting himself in the foot. Another play the Giants wish they could have back. Jackson became the first player in NFL history to end the game with the punt return touchdown as time ran out, and Matt Dodge became the first player too poor to afford a dodge after New York cut him the following training camp. The play the Eagles would like back. The ball goes off of Alshon Jeffrey's hands and gets picked versus the Saints. Personally, I would have chosen Andy Reid using a timeout at some point at the end of the Super Bowl uh, against the Patriots, but instead, I will dig into my shorts and make some room for Big a Dick Nick. Now, Philly was on another miraculous Super Bowl run with Nick Foles at the helm in the 2018 playoffs. They had just defeated the Bears with just the tip, doinking Cody Parkey's game-winning field goal attempt a week prior. And they were on the verge of upsetting the New Orleans Saints when Alshon Jeffrey's hands turned to stone and deflected Foles pass into the waiting arms of Marshawn Lattimore to put the game on ice. Had Philly won, they would have played the Rams, who they had defeated earlier in the season, and then they would have played the Patriots in the Super Bowl, who they obviously beat the year before as Nick Foles won Super Bowl MVP honors. The Washington Redskin Potatoes. Besides naming themselves the Redskins, which was a curse that led to the demise of two of their quarterback's leg bones, I'm going with Joe Gibbs calling back-to-back -back timeouts versus the Bills in the first game since Sean Taylor's death. This was a tough moment for Washington. The Skins were up two against the Bills with the time running out when Gibbs mistakenly called back-to-back -back timeouts before the same play, which led to a penalty that gave the Bills a chip-shot field goal to win. 
Washington did, however, go on to win the last four games of the 2007 season and actually made the playoffs, definitely spurred by Sean Taylor's memory. Still, that was an excruciating way to lose such an emotional game for Washington. Dallas Cowboys. The Des Bryant catch, no catch? No. I think this either has to be Tony Romo's botched hold or the Jackie Smith drop against the Steelers. Tony Romo never got enough credit on the field, but gets too much credit off the field in the booth. So I'm gonna go with Jackie Smith, so Tony Romo never gets the credit he deserves. He's making 18 million a year now, so he's fine. Jackie Smith was called- Bless his heart, he's got to be the sickest man in America. Maybe a little insulting to cancer patients watching the game by saying he was the sickest man in America, but you get the idea. The Cowboys were down seven in the third quarter of a tight game, and after Smith's drop, they had to settle for a field goal instead of the seven points. They ended up losing by four points. Smith had played 15 years for the Cardinals, had only made the playoffs twice, and Super Bowl 13 ended up being the last game of his career. Smith was a Hall of Famer, but sadly he's infamous for that crucial drop. Then we've got the Jets of New York. This one was easy for me. It's the Mo Lewis hit on Drew Bledsoe. Mo Lewis basically unleashed the equivalent of COVID-19 on the football world. Without that sideline hit, it's hard to imagine the Patriots finishing 11 and five, getting a bye and winning the Super Bowl. Down by seven to the Jets, Bledsoe rushed towards the first down marker on the sideline only to be clobbered by Mo Lewis as he regretfully fought for an extra yard. That injury to Bledsoe gave way to the Tom Brady era for the Patriots and the Jets never recovered. People forget Bledsoe nearly died from that hit, which just goes to show you how evil Tom Brady truly is. You have to realize how close he came to death. Okay. Now who knows how long Bledsoe could have held off Brady even if he was healthy. Probably for at least 10 years in my humble opinion. But that's at least one ring off of Brady's finger. Instead, Mo Lewis, who is a very good player, lost to history. Unleashed Pandora's box and an age of darkness, the likes of which we have never seen in football. Honestly, without that hit by Lewis, half of the plays in this series would be different. That is crazy. The Buffalo Bills. They want that Super Bowl kickback. This was definitely another one of the easy choices. If Scott Norwood makes the kick from 48 yards out, the Bills win the Super Bowl. If he misses, they lose to the Giants for the first of four straight Super Bowl losses. Norwood's kick, of course, went wide right, like the US in 2016. Uh, the only bright side I can think of is that this missed kick led to two great movies, The Four Falls of Buffalo and, of course, Buffalo 66. The plot of Buffalo 66 revolves around an assassination attempt on Norwood. It's very good, you should check it out. Then we've got the Patriots. The helmet catch is what they want back. Now I shudder to think of an alternate universe in which David Tyree didn't pin the ball against his helmet despite being draped by Rodney Harrison. That's not the part they could really control though. The Patriots had Eli Manning. Eli Manning in the grasp and they let him get away. I don't know what possessed Manning or Tyree or the laws of physics, but God smiled upon us all that day and gave us a true David and Goliath moment for the ages. Every time I see this replay, my heart is warmed, knowing that even though the Patriots have their sixth ring, they'll never get over the fact that they let 19 and zero slip through their fingers just like Eli did. Miami Dolphins. Now this one's controversial, but the Garo Yapremian fuck up is the play they need to get back. I mean, I could pick a play from the 1994 divisional playoffs when Miami lost to the Chargers 22 to 21, but we all know the Dolphins would have just gotten their asses kicked in the Super Bowl by the 49ers again. The Yapremian play is considered one of the worst plays ever in the NFL by many who are lucky enough to remember what happens when you let an off-season necktie salesman play kicker? Hear me out though. If Garo Yaprimian doesn't throw the ugliest pick six of all time, the Dolphins finish the only 17-0 regular season with a 17-0 victory in the Super Bowl, which would still stand up as the only shutout in Super Bowl history. Instead, they had to settle for a 14-7 victory and a 17-0 season, which I guess is still very cool, but 
could have been so, so much cooler. The Dolphins have had far worse moments, but few heartbreaking moments in high stake games. Uh, you could point to the Jets' comeback on Monday Night Football in 2000, or about 635 plays that went wrong when the Jags put up 62 points on Dan Marino's last game. But they really haven't been close enough for one play to crush their spirits. So that's actually good. The Seattle Seahawks. Easy. Easiest one of the list. This is the entire reason I thought about doing this video. Hand the ball off to Marshawn Lynch on the goal line and you are back-to-back -back Super Bowl champions while simultaneously robbing the Patriots of one Super Bowl win. That is like inventing the cure for coronavirus and also discovering the cure for coronavirus makes you super smart like Bradley Cooper in that movie where he is super smart and super handsome talking about wedding crashers. Instead, Pete Carroll and Daryl Bevel call this bizarre slant route to Ricardo Lockett, Tyler Lockett's dad probably, which was the same play Malcolm Butler had been studying all week. Hmm, makes you think. Makes you wonder if the Patriots had some dirt on the, the Seahawks. And the undrafted rookie jumps the route and ends the game with one of the most improbable plays in Super Bowl history. Now we've got the Cardinals. Kurt Warner throwing the 100-yard pick six to James Harrison in Super Bowl 43 is a play he wants back. Hell, the interception could still happen. Just have somebody fucking tackle James Harrison on that play. The Steelers were up 10 to seven before acupuncture addict James Harrison jumped the goal line pass that swung the Steelers 10 points heading into halftime up 17 to seven. Here's a note to NFL head coaches. Don't throw inside passes at the goal line in the Super Bowl. It never really works. It's stupid that an edge rusher owns the record for longest interception return in Super Bowl history. Even if Arizona settles for a field goal in that situation, they almost certainly walk away with their only Super Bowl victory in franchise history. For the Rams of St. Louis and Los Angeles, I debated the Troy Brown catch versus the Patriots or the incompletion to Brandon Cooks versus the Patriots. Basically any postseason moment involving the Patriots and the Rams and wide receivers. I'll say Brandon Cooks since that's more within the Rams control. Uh, had Jared Goff thrown the ball on time and also not overthrown a wide open Brandon Cooks late in the third quarter in Super Bowl 53, LA probably wins that game. They were only down by three in that situation and failed to ever score a touchdown in this game. Now it is eerily similar to Jimmy Garoppolo being late and missing Emmanuel Sanders in the last Super Bowl. The thing about the Rams in Super Bowl 53 is that they were one play away from winning for the entire duration of the game. Cooks could have been Super Bowl MVP had he also reeled in this tough catch late in the fourth quarter. Instead, he watched as the hand of Tom Brady beat Goff on the biggest stage on earth. And Cook realized he is actually the curse. Losing back-to-back -back Super Bowls, one with the Pats and then one with the Rams against the Pats. Now we've got the 49ers, and I think we go with Michael Crabtree's incompletion versus the Ravens. Before Colin Kaepernick was out of the league altogether, he led the 49ers on an improbable comeback against the Ravens that fell just short in Super Bowl 47. The 49ers were facing fourth and goal, down by five with under two minutes to go. Kaepernick got blitzed up the middle and lobbed a pass that was just out of the reach of Michael Crabtree, giving the ball back to the Ravens and effectively ending the game. You could argue that Mahomes' long pass to Tyreek Hill in the most recent Super Bowl could be on this list as well for the 49ers, but I also just don't want to think about that. Then we've got the Denver Broncos. The first thing that comes to mind is safety Raheem Moore letting Jacoby Jones get behind him, uh, or the interception that blew out Terrell Davis's knee, essentially ending his career. Since Denver made it to Super Bowl 15 and won, I will give Terrell Davis his knee and career back. I blame John Fox for not having the balls to give Peyton Manning a chance at the end of the Ravens Broncos game, just as much as Raheem Moore for giving up that pass to uh, Jacoby Jones. More than that, the Broncos should have won in overtime if not for a third and 13 completion to Dennis Pitta with the Ravens backed up on the three yard line. Now, Terrell Davis finally got into the Pro Football Hall of Fame and I don't know how many important wins he would have been a part of had he stayed healthy in Denver, but TD only played in 12 games 
after that injury. He blew out his knee in 99 trying to make a tackle after Brian Greasy threw an interception. Davis was coming off of his historic 2,000 yard season, and if he doesn't go down, I think Terrell Davis finishes his career as one of the top 10 or 15 all-time leading rushers. The Kansas City Chiefs, D Ford being offsides. The Chiefs have so many playoff losses, it was, it was hard to pick one. The Chiefs were on the verge of their first Super Bowl appearance since 1970, when the Patriots were facing a third and 10 late in the 2018 AFC Championship game. Brady's pass went off of Rob Gronkowski's hands and went to a chief defender who made what appeared to be the game ceiling interception. But upon closer examination, defensive end D Ford had lined up in the neutral zone and gave the Patriots extra life. For a zone that is neutral, only bad shit seems to happen there. Now we know what happened. New England scores, the Chiefs tie it up, and then the Pats score in overtime to go to yet another Super Bowl. That season, the Rams and the Chiefs battled on Monday Night Football in a 54-51 thriller that the Rams won. Instead of getting that rematch, the most anticipated rematch of the year, we got a Super Bowl literally nobody will ever talk about again. The Raiders. It's either the Immaculate Reception or the birth of Mark Davis's barber, right? I would love for this to be the tuck rule play, but I'm starting to notice all of the plays I want back would have just prevented the Patriots from winning or getting to the Super Bowl, so I don't want to be biased. So we will go with the immaculate reception. To ask for this play back is to ask God to undo a miracle because that's what this play was. All the way back in 1972, the Raiders were seconds away from victory in Pittsburgh in the AFC divisional round. On the very last play of the game and Pittsburgh at their 40 yard line, Terry Bradshaw just gets a pass off intended for Frenchie Fuqua. Fuqua? Fakua? Frenchy Fakua. Jack Tatum's hit on Fakua jars the ball loose and it goes directly to Franco Harris who runs the ball into the end zone to win the game. Now this was a controversial play because the Raiders believed the ball never touched Tatum, which would have meant Harris couldn't catch the ball because of, weird, of a weird double touch rule and that Harris picked the ball off of the ground. Now the footage was lost for a long time and when it re-emerged, every angle just adds a layer to the mystery. The best being the end zone angle where the goalpost blocks the view of whether or not the ball touched the ground. It is truly the uh, immaculate reception. They, they got it right when they named it. And finally, here in part one, we've got the Chargers. And I think I go with the Marlon McCree fumble. Rarely do you get to pick off Tom Brady in the playoffs. And even more rarely do you get to fumble in a game if you are a defensive back. Chargers safety Marlon McCree did both. And it cost San Diego the 2006 AFC Divisional game and any chance for Phillip Rivers to ever accomplish anything significant besides copulation and boosting the stock price of bolo ties. That Chargers team was stacked with 11 Pro Bowl players, and they were leading the Patriots 21-13 with six and a half minutes left in the game when McCree let Troy Brown strip him of the ball after picking off Thomas Brady's pass. That play cost Marty Schottenheimer his job and basically led to the Chargers squandering one of the most talented offenses in the NFL under Norv Turner for the next several years. And that was part one of one play every NFL team wishes they could have back. Part two is up on YouTube already. That's right, I got my crap together. You can click it right here on the screen to watch part two.